goes on an endless song above earth's lamentations I hear this sweet yet far off hymn that hails a new creation above the tumult and the strife I hear the music ringing it finds an echo in my soul how can I keep from singing? What well, though my joys and comforts die, the Lord my Savior liveth. Though the darkness gather round, songs in the night he giveth what storm can shake my inmost calm while to this refuge clinging for Christ is Lord of heaven and earth how can I keep from singing I lift my eyes, the clouds grow thin. I see the blue above it. And day by day, this path grows smooth. Since first I learned to love it. The peace of Christ makes fresh my heart. A fountain ever springing. All things are mine since I am His. How can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? Hey, how are you? Well, it's week three of Church in the Pastor's Study. How strange. You know, I'm used to doing this uh, in front of people, face-to-face -face with people, you know, with congregations or audiences or one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you know, I, I don't do this video thing. Well, we have to now, so we are doing the video thing. And I want to I thank Dan Hafner for all of his hard work on this, along with Patrick Donnelly with his work on our website. But... Um, as we were forced into it. And for those of us who are pastors, uh, it is our greatest fear is that we're going to make this look like an Osama bin Laden uh, kidnap video, like, you know, you know, that kind of thing. And we have that great fear and we don't want to. So I, it's just really weird for me to be talking to you, my friend, through my iPhone uh, strapped to a microphone stand in my study. But this is the way we have to do it for right now, and so we will. But I, I want to make a couple of points. First of all, I want to say that when this is all said and done, we should have Weird Haircut Sunday, because we're all going to look like a bunch of freaks. I tried to get a haircut three and a half weeks ago, and my barber was already afraid of the uh, coronavirus and, and closed down shop, and so I'm, I mean, I'm out here. So now I'm, I'm like three, three and a half weeks beyond what I should have and getting that John the Baptist look. I had a dream the other night. I had a dream that I ended up with a, with a hair bun. You know, the, 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 what do they call it? The man bun, the man bun thing. Um, by the way, you guys that wear the man buns, you know where that came from? From old church ladies in the South. They'd pull it all up and, you know, they had the bun, right? And you guys are doing the same thing. Now, I had great fear when I saw that in my dream because that looks terrible on an old guy, but it looks equally as dumb on a young guy. So I would, I'd recommend you drop the knot, son, you know, <laughs> that whole thing. So, um, so I think we should have Weird Hair Sunday when we finally... Uh, we finally are done with this pandemic. We should we should like not be able to get a haircut or do any coloring or highlighting or all the other stuff that makes us look beautiful. Um, we should have to come the way we are. Uh, and then we'll all laugh and we'll all get haircuts the next week. What do you think? We should do that. I also want to clear up a second thing. 
And that is for all of you who have made fun of me for years because of this thing I do. I do this thing when I go to a hotel. I pay 150 bucks or something for a room to just lay my head for there for a few hours and take a shower. So when I pay that much money, I, I take the soap and I take the shampoo and I take the cream rinse. But most important of all, I've been taking for all these years the unopened toilet paper. That's right. Sometimes they even leave two extras and they both go with me. So, <laughs> anyhow, who's laughing now? Okay. Make fun of me. Boy, I'll show you. That stuff is at home. I'm thinking I'm going to put it on eBay. Some of it could be vintage, you know. I've had it for a while. But uh, anyhow, I um, no more making fun of me about this. You see I'm the wisdom of your pastor. Oh, and one more thing. Our, our business manager, Tracy, for Christmas last year, making fun of her pastor, gets me this for Christmas. Instead of coal, you get a roll. <laughs> oh, funny, funny. Yeah, but I got it, and you can't have it back. Just want to show you. Still got it. Emergency. Right there. That's right. Oh, it's a weird time. You know, you, you have to laugh. But as, as we're starting here, I just want to say that I've talked to a lot of people this week that have had panic attacks. I know it's a scary time for a lot of folks. I know that the change in our schedule has messed with our minds and our emotions. Uh, to have all that stop like it has is uh, unnerving. Financially, it's unnerving. The fear for our loved ones makes it scary. You know, if you think of it, one of the reasons we are petrified is because we're so afraid of death. How old were you when you realized that the world is broken and messed up and there's something wrong with this place and that everybody here dies? That, that's, uh, that's tough. But how old were you? I was five or six. I remember not being able to sleep for a night when I realized that. And it's kind of been an, uh, an ongoing struggle for me throughout my life. I, I searched for answers of, of d why we all die. And does anybody care? Like, I mean, like a God, the creator. Well, to deal with our panic over what's going on right now, it's really good to deal with the eternal question of death first. And then once we settle that, we can then move on and deal with our day-to-day -day lives, um, the, the stuff that we're struggling with now. And it won't be so heightened because we have taken care of the bigger question. Well, the singular message of the Bible over the um, 3,800 years of its writing, it works together perfectly as we believe it to be the, the Word of God that God has spoken to us about why the world is broken. I mean, it, it's a broken place, yet it's so beautiful today. I got pictures today from uh, the foothills of the Alps, where a, a niece of mine and her husband and three children live in, a, in an old farmhouse. Beautiful setting. You expect uh, Julie Andrews and the family bond trap to show up at any moment. Uh, it's just a beautiful setting. Somebody else sent me a picture from the, the mountains of North Carolina. Somebody else sent me pictures from the beaches of South Carolina. and I mean, the world is a beautiful place. And yet, I have a friend that works um, as, a, as a physician in the Detroit Medical Center, and it's a war zone down there. People are dying. I mean, it's so messed up and ugly and yet so beautiful. Has that ever troubled you? Man, it bugged me. But what I found in the Bible were answers for both of these questions. Why is the world messed up? And has the Creator done anything about it? In fact, the singular message of the Bible is the history of God coming after us to fix this problem of death. It's a, a broken world. And so what I want, I want to tell you, it's me again, right? So I got three things. I'm sorry, it just happens. I said it last week, I'm saying it again. This three-point thing just happens to me, but I want to say three specific things to you about what God has done to come after you and me and to, and to make it so 
death wasn't the end. Well, it's, first of all, I want to say to you, it's ancient. This isn't just something that Jesus came up with 2,000 years ago, and we think of that as ancient. But long before that, we have pictures of it throughout the Old Testament. In fact, in the Garden of Eden, from the book of Genesis, you'll see a reference that God makes about how the seed, the child of the woman, was going to deal with the serpent and crush his head. I mean, um, really interesting. You see it in the life of Abraham, who the, the founder of the Jewish, uh, well, God's the founder of the Jewish people, but the father of the Jewish people, Abraham, in, in his hundredth year, had never had a son, and his wife in her 90s gave birth to, uh, to Isaac. And God then tells um, Abraham to take Isaac, who's now um, at least a, a preteen, to the Mount Moriah, to the mountain of Moriah, and there sacrifice his son as an offering. I mean, that is just weird. But Abraham did it. He took him up, set up an altar, and put his son on the altar and was actually going to take his life. But on the way walking up the mountain, the son, Isaac, says to his father, Abraham, Father, here's wood. He has the wood for the, for the, the burnt sacrifice. And here's fire. So they had it in a pot, probably, you know, coals in a pot to get it started. But where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. These pictures, there's another picture that's really powerful in the Older Testament. We've been dealing with um, Exodus and uh, God freeing the Jewish people from their slavery in Egypt. Well, there is this picture of the last plague was that the angel of death was going to go through all of Egypt and as a punishment to the Egyptian people, the angel of death was going to kill all the firstborn of Egypt. And it's really weird because it says that the wailing was everywhere that night because there was not a house where there wasn't a dead body. I mean, it was really strange. But for the Jewish people, God had told them to do something. He told them to select a lamb and to, to slaughter that lamb and to take the blood from that lamb and paint it on the doorposts and on the lentil, you know, the door frame of their houses. And when the death angel saw the blood, he would pass over them and they would be saved. I mean, that's, that's a historical thing that literally happened. It's an ancient picture of what was going to happen. I want to say not only is it ancient, I want to say that it's ugly. I mean, it's, you, can't, you can't dress that up. It's, it's an ugly, ugly picture. The picture of the Passover, have you ever held a lamb? I mean, I can't imagine doing that. It's an ugly, ugly picture. The, um, the other picture that is so ugly is the fulfillment of what all those pictures in the Old Testament um, foresaw for us, foretold for us. And that is the very crucifixion of Jesus. That was the most cruel way to die. It was the worst form of execution ever devised by, by um, fallen man. I mean, that's just evil. You know, in fact, uh, Pastor Gall always says this, but, um, you know, a lot of us wear crosses around our neck. I mean, that's cool. But um, if somebody from the first century saw you wearing a cross around your neck, that would be like somebody now wearing an ele a, a little model electric chair hanging around their neck. It was the picture of death. But I mean, it's ugly. You read the crucifixion story. This time of year is a good one because this is Palm Sunday, right? Well, um, it is ancient, and this, this story is ugly. I, I just want to say it. I know it's offensive, but listen, you, you got to get beyond that. 
because it's, it actually did take place, uh, these, um, these pictures that came beforehand in history, and then the moment in history 2,000 years ago when it was fulfilled. So it's, it's, it's ancient, it's ugly, but I want to say one other thing. It's essential. My buddy, uh, Jim McElrath, Jim just had bypass surgery at 86 years old, and he had to have it. I mean, those things, talk about ugly Talk about awful. We're so grateful for the medical field, for those wonderful doctors and nurses and the gift of healing that they have. And they they did this surgery on Jim and he lived and he's home and we're grateful for that. But you know, the problem was huge. He could not live without this surgery. He wasn't gonna be able to make it. And so the only choice is to go with the ugly And the going with the ugly is the big surgery. And he went through it, survived, and we are all so grateful. It's ugly, but it's essential that he went through that. And it's essential that we understand how God dealt with death. He did that by sending his own son, Jesus. You may have heard the story before. Maybe you've heard it for 50 years. Maybe you've never heard it before. But the Bible tells us how that God sent his own son, Jesus, into the world to take on death for us, to take our place. You see, all of us are dying in this world. I uh, saw a picture of me that somebody posted on Facebook. I was playing guitar somewhere. I was thin. I had a whole bunch more hair. Um, and it was, and it was dark too. It was dark. I mean, what is going on with me? I'll tell you what's going on. I have an appointment I don't want to keep. We're all dying in this world. So God sent his only son to take this curse on himself. When he died spread eagle on cross beams over a town garbage heap, he died in our place. In fact, it was, um, It was John the Baptist, the baptizer, who was the forerunner of Jesus. He told us, he connected Jesus to all these pictures in the Old Testament. When he first saw Jesus, he said, look, it's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He understood that Jesus was the Savior, the Messiah that was promised. So interesting. Well, um, it's essential that we understand this. The Bible tells us this. Okay, I'm touching my face. I'm sorry, I did. Yeah, I did. Don't tell anybody, okay? It's essential that we understand this because the Bible tells us from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, the last part of uh, of verse 22, it says this. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This is a huge problem. Our condition of being lost in our own sin, it's huge. Um, We see how it all happened when we read the book of Genesis. That first part is very important that we see it. It's literally history. The human race fell. That's when all this ugliness came in. But God came to deal with it himself when he became a man and walked among us and died in our place and shed his own blood. In fact, the apostle John When he sees Jesus in the future in heaven, he wrote the book of Revelation. The old man saw what was to come. And when he saw it, he said, and then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. There's the lamb of God. It's throughout the whole Bible. It's there. In fact, let me read to you a section um, of a few verses here in 1 Peter. Listen to this. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers. But get this. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but has been revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. The the picture is, is that after Jesus' crucifixion, they placed him in a grave. But yet for a long time, Jesus had been saying that he was going to be resurrected. 
One time they came to him, Jesus had done something uh, miraculous and then cleared the temple um, of the money changers on, on, um, in Jerusalem. And they said, what miraculous sign can you show us to, to prove that you have the authority to do this? And Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And John says, and he spoke of the temple of his body. Jesus had been saying that he was going to be resurrected. It all happened. It's a historical fact. Um, modern man is so weird in the way we try to erase the history of Jesus from our memories and from our history books. But it happened. He really was raised from the dead. And um, it's for you. You don't have to be afraid of, of death if you will simply trust that Jesus died for you. In fact, the uh, most well-known verse of the Bible, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Trust in Jesus. He died for you. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved it's for you. You don't have to be afraid of death. Now, none of us are like looking forward to it or anything. But once you trust in Christ, you then can have a perspective to be able to, to move on with the, the crisis that we're in the, the midst of. It's, it's essential that you understand it, and it's essential that you act on it, that you believe in him. When it says that whoever believes in him, it's literally who trusts in him. Jesus died for you, so you don't have to. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. I say you need to take him up on that. And then you can face the rest of, of this. I sang a song at the beginning of this video. It's an ancient hymn, well, for us, ancient, um, 18, 1868, when it was written. How can I keep from singing? Might seem like a strange song for me to sing at a moment like this, but what it's talking about is the perspective. This dear man wrote this song at the end of the Civil War. Can you imagine what the world was like then? It had all been turned upside down. The nation almost destroyed. Um, half a million people killed in that awful war. And in the midst of it all, he talked about music still welling up inside of him, this, this joy that he couldn't explain. How can I keep from singing? You can have that same joy. Oh, I'm not saying that we're not concerned or afraid. I'm not saying that we're not um, you know, nervous. But I'm saying, listen, if you deal with your eternity now, you can deal with the present. Myron always, Pastor Gall, he, he would always say something that it just rings so true. And I, for those of you who, are, who know me, you, you know, you've heard me say this a bunch of times before because um, I've stolen it from him, but I still don't claim it as my own. I give him credit. He always says when he reads a scary book, when it gets too scary, you can't stand it. It's, you know, the, the hero or the heroine is, you know, at the point of losing everything or being killed or being lost, it's whatever it is. And when you can't, when you can't stand the, the, the tension any longer, he's got to go to the end of the book and he reads the last chapter. And they lived happily ever after. After he knows that they live happily ever after, he can go back into the story to the height of the suspense and realize that they're going to live happily ever after. Here's the secret. For those who have put their faith in Jesus, we know about our eternity, about our ever after, that we will live happily ever after. You can know that too. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I came to him, um, my goodness, almost, almost 50 years ago. I know I don't look that old, I know. But uh, I was 18 years old, so I guess it's 50, 59 and a, 58 and a half years ago. 48 and a half years ago, I can do math sometimes. But I came to him then, uh, when this 
dawned on me that he had died for me. Do you realize that, that he died for you? Well, I, I trusted him all those years ago, and he's never let me down. I've been disappointed with a lot of people and a lot of things through my life, but never disappointed with him. Um, the answers that I, that I find in the Bible fit reality. They fit the world that I live in. They're not some weirdo religious ideas. I know they're strange sounding, but they're historically true. And when the Bible talks about the condition of the human race, when you look around, it's exactly what it describes. So you can trust him. He's told us the truth and he loves us. So today, deal with your eternity. What I'd suggest is this. Why don't you get alone? Uh, of course, uh, for those of you who live, live alone, you are alone because of uh, the situation. But I mean, get away from everybody and talk to Jesus. Ask him to save you. Ask him to forgive you. Tell him that you believe that he died for you and invite him into your life. You will never be the same. I encourage you to do that. All right, we're almost done. But, you know, this is the first, first Sunday of the month. And our tradition at Community Bible Church is to celebrate communion together. And this will be the first time we ever did this through video. But I don't want us to not celebrate communion together. Jesus is our Passover lamb, like we talked about, right? And they were to take the Passover lamb and eat it uh, in their houses, uh, with the blood on the on the door frames. And then Jesus instituted something very interesting and in kind of picturing that um, when the night before he was betrayed, he took bread. And if you want to pause this, pause this for just a moment and find yourself a little cracker or a piece of bread or something and a little something, you know, to drink, some, some juice or anything, and then start the video again, Okay. All right. So when Jesus was betrayed, he did this thing on the last night, um, just before he was to be handed over to the political leaders in Jerusalem. He was only going to be here on earth for a few more hours before his crucifixion. And he did something. He took the last piece of matzah from the Passover, from the Jewish Passover that they had just, um, they had just celebrated together. And he said, this represents my body, which is broken for you. Um, do you believe that Jesus died for you? Then take the bread and eat it. And then he took the, the, uh, the cup, the last cup of wine that was um, to be drunk there at the Passover, and said, this represents a new covenant that I make with you in my blood. I, I will make you right with God. I will do this for you. And so um, he told us to take the cup and drink it. So take the cup, drink it. And then he said, as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're telling people about my death until I return. Um amazing, simple ritual that we do as Christians. It's, um, I know that doesn't seem very religious, does it? But it's true. Jesus told us to do this, to remember him. So my friend, God bless you. I hope, uh, I hope you have a better week. I hope you're getting more into, into a sink. Again, stay busy. Do everything you can around your house. Clean it all four times. Think of how clean our houses are going to be when this is over. And uh, how nice our lawns and everything are going to look. Uh, this next week, it's going to be my um, my uh, my beds around the house. I've got to edge everything and try to get everything looking better. So, um, God bless you this week. And we're gonna we're gonna say a prayer together as we close too. Shall we pray? So we usually close our eyes and then we talk to the Lord this way. Lord, thank you for dying for us, for being the ancient foretold Passover Lamb. And Lord, I ask for my friends that you will help all of us to take that simple step of faith, believing that you died for each of us as individuals. So Lord, you said, whoever 
believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So that's our name in the Bible. We, we trust. We ask you bless everybody, the sound of my voice. And uh, we thank you for sustaining us and helping us during this difficult time. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, have a better week. Thank you for listening. If you would like to support Community Bible Church, we would appreciate your prayers and gifts. We can be reached at Community Bible Church, 1888 Crescent Lake Road, Waterford, Michigan, 48327, or at our website, www.cbcmi.com. We'd appreciate your gifts. We know that many can't give right now. So if you would, you'd be a great blessing to your brothers and sisters. God bless you. Have a great day.